Good evening, people. As we finish up uh, the Pittsburgh version of the polar vortex, not as bad as uh, Chicago, which uh, was reaching reaching into the 40s and 50s in wind chill. But uh, you know, I'm I'm here tonight. I'm here tonight. Should we should we go with uh, with a frosty uh, nickname? Go for it. Yep. All right. Ah, we're here with Chris Milkshake Fletcher. Uh, the girls will come to my yard for the milkshake. <laughs> uh, you're killing me. <laughs> I I figured that was so you. That was so you. I'm I'm gonna. I, I had one for Gary that I'm gonna keep here. I'm gonna call him Gary K9 Ken. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and since uh, you know you always used to compare me, Fletch, to a a little Dave Parker. I'm going to go with Dave the Little Cobra. Nice. Oh, that's good. That's a good one. I like that one. So, uh, tonight, uh, I have a special announcement. One of my favorite times. It's the Stratomatic 2019 reorder. Time. Oh! Officially yeah, there. What, Officially the last, there. The 24th was the first day I saw. I got an email or something. Did you guys... Yeah. Well, it's, it's there. This this year we're going to concentrate on on upgrading uh, the review process in Stratomatic. So you know, you two can. Uh, uh, what was the what was the uh, umpire's name? Uh, Pittsburgh versus Atlanta called the guy uh, safe who got tagged out halfway up the line. Jerry Mealy. Yeah, I think you may have that. Uh, yeah, one. Yep. yeah, I guess it was. Yeah, I was going to say I was trying to because of course Randy Marsh was famous. Of course, who was it? Who was it went out? Was it McSherry went out? It was whatever. I can't remember who the changed in that championship game. But you're right. I think it was Jerry Neely. I think you're right. Yeah. Oh, all right. So we can we can uh, we can go with the Jerry Mealy uh, uh, rule. Uh, you know, with Stratomatic a little better and the more thoroughly dynamic 1980 season, which was a huge disappointment in Pittsburgh. Lots of injuries. Blew the uh yeah. blew the, the division in the last month of the year. Yep. But yep. uh anyways, that's always my, my premium night. How are you doing tonight, gentlemen, now that you know it's stratomatic uh, uh pre order time. What did you buy? Did you buy eighty and, and the current one or what did you buy? Oh no, I'm 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 buying the current one and I am uh probably going to uh go with uh, 02 and 03 because I have 01. Okay. okay. Uh, the second two uh, of the uh, National League pennants. You talk about the early bucks uh, now. You talk about the 1902. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking 19. Yeah, see, I have all of those. But yeah, that's uh, 02 is an interesting year in particular. And so is 03, yeah. actually. So, um, but yeah. Um, I haven't bought any yet. I'm probably, I'm going to probably buy a few of them. Um, you'll, get, you'll get the 2018 Japanese League. I definitely will. I, I like that stuff. It's it's amazing. It really does mirror big league baseball in a lot of ways. Of course, no yeah. surprise they copy everything, but with the strikeouts and stuff, and I like that. And I always like some of those past seasons. I think they. I saw was nineteen twelve the Negro League kind of, which is all. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They have that. that. Good. I, I generally do. And uh, somebody up there really ought to pay attention to me because it's it's sick. I mean, and if you. <laughs> You looked in my if you looked in my vault, there's like a there's like a hundred baseball oh, like man. fifty hockey. It's 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 pretty yeah. it's pretty diseased. We have to figure I'm out how to do the online a, thing one day. What were your favorites, still, Fletch? Uh, I'm still sitting on a mound of the old floppy disk version that I'm <laughs> there's any way to, to restore that that would be fun. But uh I love you know the the, the, the one of the the seasons I loved was the, the, both the '68 and the '69. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I agree with you. You were scratch. You were it was scratching. a quick year. I, that was a quick year to go. Not not much hitting. '68 especially mm-hmm. not much hitting. Yeah. Change the mounds. But, but then, man, yeah. you had to, you scratched and you ran and you did everything you could. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, two runs. Two runs was important. Oh man, yeah, that's what I remember about playing '68. Padres, just how quick it went. You know, I'll have to call up and and see if uh, those are salvageable leagues. You, the, the little three point five floppies. Yes. You could probably get somebody to transfer that for you, Fletch. Somehow. You now the other the other fun league I did 
was I, I took the worst teams of all time. Mm-hmm. I took 24 of them, and I put them in a league. Because someone had to win. Who would you manage? Uh, I, I think I managed the uh, 69 Padre. Yeah, they were, ah, okay. One ten. Yeah, they were bad. They were One bad. Ten. They were truly bad. 52. But it was, it was fun to see uh, the teams actually winning 80 games out of all those bad teams. <laughs> <laughs> did you have the 62 Mets in there? I did. I did. How'd they end up? They were awful, as I recall. It's been a long <laughs> I had a notebook where I pr- had all my printouts. I'll see if I can find that. Oh, they man. had the most fours of every position, Dave. You go back and look at it, particularly like in a basic game. Every one of the Mets yeah. had a four fielder. Every, pretty much every <laughs> one. Of the, some of the I mean, you never see that. So I think only Richie oh. Ashburn was less than a four. Well, an interesting thing would be to put the, put the three great pitchers in that rotation and just see oh. how uh, how that defense would destroy their stats. Wow. One last. I replayed the 69 Pilots, Fletch, which was might have been one of that group, although they weren't that bad. They were like 64. They weren't that bad. They were middle of the pack. They were 64-98, I think, originally, or, or rather, yep. actually. But that year, when I replayed the season to get into August, so they're playing the Orioles, and Palmer threw a no-hitter on a Tuesday, and then he threw a no-hitter against them the following week on Thursday. Oh, God. Wow. No hitters against the same team within a week. You know? Oh, man. Struck that was Don one of the Mincher. classic He hats. struck out Don Mincher like eight straight times or something like that. So. <laughs> uh, well, that was the Jim Bouton team. Yes, it was. It was? Yes, it, was. it was. Tommy Harper, oh, Tommy man. Davis. Yep. yep. Yeah. Well, uh, you're right, Dave. Classic, classic ball cap on that one, too. With great union. Oh. Yep. And a great jersey. A very underrated jersey. I, I, I really, agree. Yeah. There's always a fan of the jersey, but uh, well, we we had some uh, jersey and hat uh, controversies uh, in the last week, uh, as we uh, we had our uh, 2019 Hall of Fame vote. Uh, Mike Bucina and the widow of Roy Halladay both uh, uh, deciding to go in with no uh, yeah. logo on the hat. Uh, call him either a pussy or call him something that I do, and that that's that's the way I think because you know. Halliday is still a Toronto Blue Jay. He, he's still a Philadelphia Philly. It doesn't take that away. I kind of think the the call of the logo, especially when Reggie made all his uh, made all his hay in a, a Oakland A's uniform and decided to put a then he put the New York Yankee hat on. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah which which was bullshit. So I I, I thought they were great decisions. That's what I would do. Um, you know, with you know what it was like, Dave. It was like what was it like? Baseball cards back in the back in the early seventies uh, when you would have the traded, traded cards. Yeah. And there and there would be just the, the really badly airbrushed caps. That was it. <laughs> Those were classics. Those were, were classics. Some you know. Uh, they didn't have graphic design back then. What were you gonna do? Uh, what were you didn't gonna do? Cena have a big contract dispute. I kinda remember him like Piazza having kind of an acrimonious am I wrong? No, I think you're right. I'm surprised that he didn't pick the Orioles because I mean I know he he won I guess with the Yankees a couple times and he got a yeah, big contract. He, but didn't didn't he, uh, he, he he hated being there? It seemed like he hated being there. He didn't like New York. That yeah, you could see it on his face. But yeah. I thought he was like Piazza, where like he wanted to sign, but they wouldn't come anywhere near the money. And he's like, that's it, right. I'm moving. So I guess well, I uh, get that one a little bit, but it's kind of childish to me to not pick something. Right, nice. and I would figure uh, uh, Steinbrenner must have paid him some some bucks to do that because it made no sense. Everything I heard, he did not enjoy his time there, and no, he looked and spent a lot a lot of time there. No, he didn't. He should have he done the Seattle Pilots helmet hat. You know, hey, exactly. do it that way at least. Exactly. I wonder if you can do that. Choose a hat of somewhere you didn't play. <laughs> Just I like this hat. <laughs> I like the hat. <laughs> Always want to wear this hat. Uh, oh man. But it was an interesting, the, probably the least important position on the field, and I'm going to make that that the bullpen is the least important. Well, it's becoming more important, but generally in history it has been the least important position, but the only man to get 100% of the vote, which says nothing more than, I mean, you know, people are trying to make it seem like, you know, somehow Rivera is the greatest player ever to play the game, which he's not. He's not even close, but I just I found it humorous that the only man to get 100% is 
is a reliever, a guy who, if he uh, was not a Yankee, uh, take the same stats, win as much, but if he is not a Yankee, he's he's going about six, seven years before he gets in. So it was kind of a bullshit thing, uh, you know, the whole 100%. Although the more bullshit that somebody would vote against Ted Williams and Babe Ruth and, and Hannes Wagner, I think that, that probably outlines what's more bullshit. But, um, you know, well, there, there are those old-timers who, who refuse to put anybody in on their yeah. first ballot, which, come on, a guy's a Hall of Famer, he's not. That's, that's just I a mean, poor shit. Especially when you're, you, you're of the pedigree of, you know, a man who hits more home runs than every team in baseball in one season. I mean, that that anybody who who had that going for him was just, it was just bullshit. But, I mean, you know, Rivera certainly deserves it. And he is, he is the best reliever of all time. And, and um, you know, certainly the post best postseason. postseason. But, I mean, they, they, I think he got in here because he was in just about every postseason. Yeah, and he was, and he was, he was always he was better in those situations than even he was at times in a consistency during a regular season. Right. And they won a except for one game seven. One game seven, right, yes, exactly. But other than that, that was, that was still, towards the end of the road. But right. yeah, he was, was so was, dominant was, in the postseason and yeah. pretty decent guy. You know, he really didn't speak much English, but never, never really obnoxious or. I mean, too much of the personality is clearly coming in now and stuff of the stuff we'll talk about. Yeah. I think it works both ways. It's almost too much here. You know, well, the it, last guy who never besmirched the game, that's not necessarily enough for 100%. Right. But, but he was, he, the postseason just, it made him, you know. It just, it just yeah. made him. So. Uh, absolutely. And, and yeah. Edgar Martinez, who I was against going in at first, uh, the DH bias probably, but looking at his stats, I mean, he had some monster seasons. He won a couple batting titles. Um, I mean, the man won his own award as a top DH. Uh, not many people can say that. Uh, getting three uh, Edgar Martinez awards. Um, I got the Chris Fletcher right. award. Come on. Come on. <laughs> you know a better Chris Fletcher out there than me? I don't think so. Maybe the one who plays the San Diego Chargers in our youth. But. I, I think that deserves uh, some, some thorough research to see how many, uh, how many people uh, would qualify for the Chris Fletcher. I, I think you might have something there. But uh, you know, certainly more of a of a claim than Edgar Martinez. But yeah, it's a monster years. I mean, a 9.33 OPS really kind of sold me on him. Um, you know, even though he's a wuss boy and didn't go on the field. And let's say it. Let's say it. The H's are wuss boys. Although I saw in a recent thing that they are the highest paid position in baseball next to pitchers, which I would kind of took me by surprise because I would have thought the DH, um, you were getting older veterans uh, uh, at a little bit of a savings, but I guess not. Um, thoughts on Edgar Martinez? Did you? I'm sorry, Dave. Did you go to one of us? Yeah, I, Gary, you're up. I wanted some I mean, thoughts. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I mean, I, the DH thing, I, you know, I hate the rule. I think we probably yeah. all do. I'm not sure we do, but, I, I mean, I hate the rule, but it's not going away. You know, you can't penalize a guy. It's kind of like we talked about Baines a little bit. I mean, you can't penalize a guy for what the game changed the rules to. I mean, Martinez was not a good third baseman. I mean, I remember in the early part of his career, he was kind of like Steve Garvey was. He would throw the ball all over. He was horrible. Yeah. But that's the league, you know, and he can't help the fact that he was in an era where that was the rules. So I, I can't I, – to me, personally, I cannot penalize him for that. I mean – Agree on the OPS day, but I mean, I think another big thing is the fact that he won two batting titles. That's yeah. pretty big when you think about it historically. And he drove in over 100 runs, you know, particularly in a pitcher's ballpark later in his yeah. career. I mean, he was a pretty good RBI guy. He was a tough guy up there. So, I mean, he's a little bit borderline to me, but I just think, it, 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 I guess the way I keep looking at this, 312 career average pretty good, too, particularly in the era he played in. Sure. Um, now, yeah, he's got some pretty good, pretty good numbers, and unfortunately, you know, with the era that you're in, and I think particularly like with pitchers and stuff, you're just not going to see the staggering statistics you used to see. But I mean, he was a good clutch hitter. He he generally played a lot of games. I mean, it was rare that he missed. He had a couple years where he was injured a lot, but he had a lot of years where he played 150, 155 games. Now, I know it's at DH, but he's still in there. 
lot of extra base hits. Yeah. Kingdom he helped that, but he drove in a ton of runs. He did. Um, but, but I don't think Fletcher is going to agree with line, that. But I can't be bitching about it is the way I feel. Like, it's not that horrible here. I think Fletcher's so, going to disagree with you here. I he probably it. will because I saw his, his text the minute it happened. I mean, he's certainly borderline to me, but well, he's which got some things you can make an argument. You know, he has, he has borderline can't. career statistics. That was my problem. Yep. Fletcher. Well, I, I agree. I mean, I think he was borderline. I was surprised he got in. I really was. Um, you know, he did play 155 games a year, but you know what? You take out a lot of risk for injury when you're not out on the field. You do. So yeah. that's, you know, that's yeah. not exactly a, a great thing. Is, you know, I'm going to come up and I'm going to you know, have my three to four bats a game. But at the same time, you know, it, it's also – I think it's a dip, more difficult position than I think we give it credit for because it, many times it's harder to get into the flow of the game, I think, with DH yep. than it's an everyday – um, yeah, position player. So, I mean, there is that to it. He had good stats. A lot of it, I think, Gary, you hit it on the, on the nail on the head, too. A lot of them were probably ballpark-aided. Uh, yep. um, I, I, the thing that, that really got me with this is, you know, we're still trying to figure out what to do with these steroid guys. I mean, I would put Bonds in before I put Martinez in. And no even though... Uh, you know, a lot of what Bonds did toward the end of his career was tainted. I think we can all agree that up until that point, he was a certain Hall of Fame. Yeah. So, I, um, I, I, and you don't know, like, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, what pitchers were also on it he was facing. So, it just gets, a, it, it gets a little, little dicey. And, you know, there's still some guys... You know, from the from the older times, I would rather see him than, than Edgar Martinez. I, I'd still rather see Tony Oliva. I'd still rather see Dave Parker. I'd still rather see Dale Murphy. I'd rather see any of those guys than, than Edgar Martinez. I know that that's not how it works, but um, well, I I I tend to agree with it. I I you know, Dave Parker's a prime example. You take away the batting average, which Parker still had a good one. I think his was two ninety eight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, but. Um, I thought Parker would have superior stats. And, again, if I'm drafting a team, are you going to take Parker or are you going to take Edgar Martinez first? Yeah, I That's agree. the part with the too much statistical look and too much opinion. I mean, the opinion of Parker's play in the 70s, particularly during that three- or four-year run, and even after. I mean, his year, he continues a pretty good pro, although not the same dominant player since right. Addy Oakland and other places, but pretty damn Top flight player, you know, top fifty player, right? You know, you can't. I mean, did you ever talk out yep. of both sides of your mouth? Either right. were they that, and is that your criterion, or are you going to look at like I think both the inductees this year, they benefited from numbers that are certainly not, you know, at the upper echelon of the hall, but if you look at it in the era they were in, they had a lot of longevity and they piled up a ton of numbers because of it. Even Baines, yeah, right. If, so what I, I'm not this. It goes almost like we 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 we, re, we rail about like the way these guys evaluate these teams in the game now. Numbers are not the whole story, right? The whole story is during an era were you the best during whatever period of time you want to define, and that's open to some that's open to opinion, you know. And and I think the same thing I'd say with the steroid controversy. You know, the the facts are probably that two guys who can't get in there and can't get above whatever it is. 40% or 50% and probably never will. I'm sorry if you don't like their personality. I'm sorry if they did that, but you're right. That's the whole era did it. They were the most dominant players. And if you said, I'm going to start with Clemens on the mound or I'm going to start my field with Bonds, anybody in baseball that says steroids or not, I agree with you. So, I mean, I think it's time to kind of take away to me some of this over analysis of numbers and, and character and what's the bottom line. You know, and the bottom line is 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 that there's really no reason that Bonds and Clemens and those guys shouldn't be in there. You want to do whatever you want to say, go ahead, Dave. I know you say right. you don't give a damn, but the facts are they were still the most dominant player. You can't say that about Mart- Martinez or Messina in my view. I don't know how you guys. Feel. No, no. I mean, Roy Holiday. I think we can all agree. Yep. Um, was certainly, yeah. if yep. not the best pitcher of his era, one of the top two or three. Um, yep. I mean. But Musina, I, I look down. He's the one that bothers me out of the guys that made it um, on this. He's done Sutton. 
he has done something. That's exactly 18 years. It took him 18 years to get 270 wins. He doesn't win 20 games until once. his final season. Yeah, once. Um, and even he, he, I mean, he gives up more hits than than innings pitched that final season that he does it, um, which to me is that's not a Hall of Fame pitcher. Um, here's a guy that that um, I mean, people claim blah blah blah. He was a great piece of Yankee winning Yankee teams. He had four ERAs in, in three of his seasons with the Yankees, of his eight seasons, a five ERA in yeah. one season. Um, I mean, he has a three six eight ERA. That, that, to me, is not a guy you look at and say was one of the dominant. I don't care if it was hitting or not. Maddox was in a hitting era and, and had incredible stats. Um, the one-two uh, um, whip, which is good, but not, you know, Yep. First line Hall of Fame things. He he uh, he uh, didn't win a, a Cy Young. Um, you know, I, I I I look at him, and you're right, Fletch. He's a, he's a, a Don Sutton at at best, and Don Sutton is not a guy I, I would ever consider as a top notch high. He he's a guy I wouldn't have put in the Hall of Fame. I'm I'm not a longevity guy at all. But his average year was 17 and 10. Good pitcher, not a great pitcher. Right. Um, I mean, if I'm going to put someone like that in, I'm going to put in Jim Cott because he could feel better. Yeah, and, and absolutely. I, yeah, pretty similar wins and stuff and other stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, Jim Palmer, ironically, has almost the amazing, almost amazingly similar games pitched, started, wins, losses. But if you said of the two, now, of course, without speaking with a heart, what did Palmer win? Three Cy Youngs? Right. right. Uh, he was the most dominant the best one pitcher in the game. Times. Mishina wasn't anywhere near that, but their numbers are the same. So this just seems to be confusion about what these guys really want to pick on, you know, like yeah. and, and whether it's writers or anybody else. I mean, if you looked at statistics, Mishina did it took him a little longer. I think probably what Palmer probably pitched 15 years, I'm guessing. So, but his numbers are amazingly similar. But which of the two would you take? Right. Right. And statistics right. don't always tell you that. So, because Palmer had a peak. He did. He had a peak that was amazing. He did. You know, this, this it's it's gonna, yep. And, I mean, you can say he pitched in a lot of postseasons, but you know what? He had a losing record Yep. in, in the postseason. So, yep. you know, you don't even have that going for you. Um, but I but, looked at um, that just out of curiosity because I'm thinking, well, I'm, you know, he. I think he kind of – I just remembered he had similar numbers. The numbers are mirror image almost, other than the fact that he didn't. he wasn't around quite as long. Yeah. He didn't give up quite as many hits per innings pitch and stuff either, but he was far more dominant. So what do the numbers tell you? I mean, that, that, you can't base it on that either. I mean, you got to. I think there has to be some subject subjectivity in are you top of your game, were you near the top of your game in the area you were in? And I think well, and, and look, I just pulled Palmer up. He, he, you're right. The records were almost similar, and he averaged seventeen ten, but he had a two eight six um, yep um, ERA yep. Um, he wins, uh, leads the league and wins three consecutive times, two yep. ERA titles. Yep. Um, he is one, two, three Cy Youngs, uh, yep. a number, a second place finish as an MVP. Um, looks like he has three top ten finishes as an MVP. So, um, I mean, the man had an in- incredible uh, uh, peak on him. I mean, he, he blows up a little towards the end of his career and. You know, has one, two, three, four, five, six of his nineteen years at the end were not too good. They were average. Yep, I remember. Yeah. But growing up, but that yeah. brings him down. Musina on the other end, it seems you know his he gets a lot of wins in New York, but doesn't pitch effectively. Um, it just seems to well, be some, sometimes o- wins are, are one of the most overrated yes. stats. You know. Yes, good so going to get a lot. Bad teams not going to get as many. There should be a thing that that. Um, Right. Uh, that you track uh, winning percentage above team winning percentage. Well, look at this. Me, way. Th- think of 1972 and what Steve Carlton accomplished. For Philly, he won 50 some games that year, if I if I recall. Yeah. He had 27 yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's insane. But don't you think somebody as a writer takes this out and says, well, let's take a look at like a former Oriole pitcher, and they lay it aside and they say, well, you know, okay, well, on this basis, he deserves to be in there. Well, don't, don't, don't you think you have to look at it and say, 
at, what, at any point, was he one of the top players in the game? That's where and I it, start. And, 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 I think and he, he was not. You know a Hall of Famer when you see him. I mean, there is some subjectivity, obviously. But, I mean, there were years when, when Bonds was clearly the best player in the game. Yep. There were years that Dave Parker, in, in the mid-'70s, your, your choice was going to be Jim Rice or Dave Parker. Right. Those were the two top players in right. the game, and then there's everybody else. Right. Well, if if you that took matters. out the crutch, the sportsmanship crutch, which, yep, yeah, it's important to be a nice guy, get back, blah, 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 but this is a museum celebrating the best in the game. So I kind of like what football does. They, they don't really, I mean, you left in a mass murder, not a mass murder, but a murder, nonetheless. Uh, uh, but... Um, in baseball, I believe he would have been taken out, I, I, or not even got, given a chance to be considered, even not, but, not for some. Well, time. he was in before they do. I mean, don't forget when OJ was voted in, he was, you know, uh, he's OJ. He one of the, one of the great people. He's OJ. He jumps. He jumps in airports. <laughs> but uh, whether you think you somebody's know, that, a jerk or not, it's not a criteria. I mean, no. Then take no, Cobb, and, and you, even take Ruth out. Take take uh, Lefty Grove out. Take Frank Chance out. I mean, right? No, Kathy not a criterion. I'm sorry. So. Yeah, but I mean, you look down here. I mean, two things that struck me is I really expect Clemens and Bonds to be in the mid '60s. If they're in the mid '60s at this point, they got a chance to get in. They made virtually no. Um, no uh, uh, advancement this year, and no that to me that spoke uh, just um, j- just eons uh, a message that they're just not getting in. Now the thing that just always, and we were on this before, and you know I'll just repeat it. So you have come up, and you have you know as the police, as the moral police, you have said um, that somehow Manny Ramirez is worth 23% of the vote, and Sammy Sosa, which just blows my mind, because either is Sammy Sosa ever any worse than uh, Manny Ramirez or Bonds or Clemens. I mean, his stats are pretty damn up there. But as a villain, um, you know, what what makes him only get 8% of the vote and the other guys get significantly more who are basically being kicked out for the same reason? I, I think that's just comical. And Fred McGriff, you know, I know you've long been a proponent of his, Fletch, but I look down, if he gets seven more homers, he's in the Hall of Fame. Seven right. friggin' homers, and now he's out. Yep. Yep. I mean, he will get in in a veterans committee. I, I, I think so. Think he'll get in. Yeah. But I don't understand that. Seven home runs, and he's a Hall of Famer. Well, it's going to be okay. interesting next year because you're going to have Derek Jeter, right? Yeah. Soriano. Yeah. Um, who else? Probably the Giambi next year also? Could be. Well, let me take a look at here. Uh, let's move to the 2020. I thought also it was an, um, even though he got 0.9% of the vote, I thought it was very telling that uh, uh, Roy Oswald got uh, more Hall of Fame votes than Patton Oswald. <laughs> And only slightly more than I did. <laughs> only slightly more than you did. J.J. Putz is on next year's. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That strikes me coming highly out. debated. Uh, what do we got? We got Jeter, Abreu, Giambi, uh, the great Cliff Lee. Uh, oh. Paul Koneko's in. He's in. Uh, Adam Dunn? Oh, that's Dunn. Wow. Uh, do you put Kernerko in, do you? <laughs> no. 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 Okay. no. Although he's got better stats than I thought. But no, he's, yeah, he's, he's, right. he's, he's a lot of power stats there. toward the end, yeah. yeah. RBIs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd say Jeter is the only um, the only sure well, shot you, there. You have Bobby Abreu who played, you know, he's, I, is he still playing or not? <laughs> <laughs> He's still praying, but they you know, still not running it out. Like Mario Lemieux, they'll let him get in the Hall of Fame too. Uh, Ryan Ludwig, uh, you know, he's got a shot. <laughs> he's in oh, there. Isn't Adam LaRoche coming up at some point? He will be coming up. He will be coming up. Lyle Overbay, some great uh, former Pirates. 
Oh, Dan Ugla's got to be coming soon. <laughs> oh, Joan Figgins. All right. You'll look forward to his. His, uh... Wow. Brad Penny. There's Brad Penny. There's another one there. Uh, Adam Dunn. Adam Dunn has a, uh... Has a nine o o e r a. I don't. I, I wonder if that'll hurt him. Well, plus he looks like Will Ferrell. That's got to help. <laughs> he, he does. He does. Like Will Ferrell. That help. That's but you know, Nate McClough. Nate McClough. There you go. Oh. Eligible next year. He of the wow. two forty seven career hitting. Wow. Boy, he. And he looks like Anthony Michael Hall. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who was in as Whitey uh, Ford? I think. Uh, I think he gave the speech uh, when Whitey Ford he was did. elected. He did. Oh, man. Carlos Pena, Moneyball, Moneyball first baseman, eligible next year. Traded wow. so uh, Art Howe couldn't play him in the movie. Oh, man. Well, so Jeter, <laughs> Jeter and there's going to be a big thing about Jeter getting 100%, which, again, uh, yeah. Yeah. means shit. Yeah. Just it means as much as those who tried to compare him to Honus Wagner and argue he to be the greatest shortstop of all time, which he's not, can't even no. sell the jock strap. He, he's the greatest shortstop we ever played in, in New York, is really what he is. Exactly, exactly. Another guy, uh, post-se- a very good postseason player. Oh. Another guy getting a lot more credit because he was in New York and he was a very good postseason player on TV all the time. Yeah. If you exactly. put him in Kansas City, he would have, people say he's a good player, he wouldn't be getting anywhere near the recognition he did. He wouldn't be, no. no. Oh, so, not yeah. but I mean, I like Jeter. I mean, he you know, he's played a lot of games. Yeah, he really missed yeah. time. Yeah, um, his range was pretty good. He, you know, he he was a good clutch hitter. But yeah, I mean, you can't talk about him in the top echelon of short stuff. So the yeah. team he was on, mm-hmm. teams he was on, the organizations he was on, maybe yes, a couple of those teams, the '98 team. Well, he was no uh, Raul Ibanez, who uh, uh, Banyas, will yeah. qualify next year too. Yeah, yep. you know. Oh. But uh, yeah, talk about the I Hall of Fame. I think, uh, to me, guys, they gotta make our we gotta make our mind up here. If if we yeah. if we're in this statistic crazed era, you got a harder argument to say that Martinez and Yusina aren't in there. That to me is not the criteria. Now that is subjective. If you go with was this guy a dominant player? What was his position at the time? Whatever. But honest to God, until you got up to like 1980, that's what people made the decision almost solely on. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you if you got 400 homers, you were in. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, right. As I, as I said, I mean, it, it's it's a crime that it's it, it, on one end it surprises the hell out of me that Vizquel is getting the and I I love him defensively and I yep. his offensive numbers are actually quite surprising and I think he does deserve in the Hall of Fame. I just am shocked he's getting uh, the recognition he is so far because that doesn't he seems like a veterans committee guy. I would think. Uh, people always talk about there's not many shortstops. They always talk about it's really yeah. Smith primarily that's in there because of the glove. Right. He's being aided by that. And here was a guy that was pretty much a pretty damn good guy, like the exact antithesis of a Bonds or Clemens or Bell. Yeah. The opposite way. I, he wasn't the overly most friendly guy when I saw him you know, live or I saw some of the Indians games live or wherever it was, but he wasn't a bad guy either. You know, never besmirched the game. Never, yeah, he was never in trouble. Right, and I think sometimes these writers, they, you know, it's like it's like bring out what's next, the apple pie, the cross, and Ronald Reagan back. I mean, you know, come on. I mean, I'm not sure just because he was a great shortstop, he's a decent guy, he played a lot of years too. I'm right. surprised a little bit at that too, Dave. I'm with you. I mean, um, yeah. You know, yeah, hard to understand. I, so, yeah, well, we'll have uh, we'll have the football Hall of Fame uh, announced in two days. Hopefully, knock on wood, Fanica. I think he's got a decent shot this year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm hoping he's not going to run out of chances like LC did. But mm-hmm. um, boy, Fanica was a, he was a hell of a leader in the locker room, of which we seem void of one right now. Uh, uh, our dear Juju comes on today at the interviews, which made me laugh my ass off. We got to stop being the Kardashians, and shockingly, that is what our our uh, our little Steelers have it turned into. Um, I mean, now the call from Cower and Bettis is you sit A.B. and Ben in a room. You know what? I, I, 
I'm not sure if if you bring AB back. And the one thing, I mean, you guys know I, I've been a Tomlin supporter through and through. I get mad when people besearch his uh, coaching abilities, which, you know, I think he's he's a tremendous coach and a better coach than Cower. But if these reports are true um, uh, of just the way he's uh, he's led different players kind of run roughshod, if, uh, depending on their um, on their abilities, that, that's that's going to kind of make it tough to bring AB back. I don't agree with what Abetta says, and you know, you, you you let AB get away with it. You can't blame him for everything, which is bullshit. He's an adult. I mean, he knows you know right and wrong, and you know damn well what you're doing is wrong and not good for the team. Um, so I don't tend to believe that, but I, I don't. How do you let a guy like AB come back? Um, I mean, I I know it's going to be cheaper if they um, if they actually keep him and pay him to sit on the bench um, because you get twenty one million nicked against you if he leaves uh, in dead money, and I think fourteen million if he stays. But um, I just don't see how how you bring him back at this point and say all of a sudden is AB going to be a you know a team player at that point? You got to come. I mean. Can Tomlin is he the type that's going to end this uh, this star treatment, so to speak, and let guys get away with this and that? Because there is no leader in the locker room. Ben is your leader. Ben is a horrific leader um, when it comes to the locker room because Ben is a is an all about me kind of guy. Um, so I I just I, I don't see any way you can bring AB back at this point. You might have to settle for a second and third round draft pick. To boot, but I mean, two questions beg to be asked: Is is Tomlin, if it's all true, what uh, what was written? Um, I forget. I think it was an ESPN article. Um, is he going to be able to change around and and do the Belichick thing, where you know we're a team, we all have to do this. If you don't do it, blah blah blah. Which um, I mean, it also takes a two way street. Brady seems like the kind of guy that'll do anything he can to. Um, to win a game, and, um, you know, is, is Tomlin going to be able to pull that discipline in? And, I mean, you have no leaders. You literally have no leaders. You you seem to have players right now taking delight in what's going on with A.B. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure where we go from here at this point, guys, unless we're willing to just blow it up and start fresh. Um, your Kardashian thoughts, Fletch. Well, I think probably the most telling thought was an interview today with uh, Heinz Ward, where he basically said that this team is is what they used to consider the Bengals to be, a team with a lot of talent that that will self destruct. And that when you when he said that, I thought, my God, he's right. That is yep. a perfect yep. Yep. explanation of, of what we saw this year. I mean, that, that team is talented enough. Um, just, you know, I was thinking about the, the Super Bowl, and there, there's something I'm going to tell you that, that's going to just, like, it's going to blow your mind here. So I can find it. So let's find my mind to, or find the thing? <laughs> a little bit of both. Um, let's go back to its draft weekend, NFL draft weekend last year, okay? Okay. So CBS Sports puts out their, their odds for winning the Super Bowl. No surprise on, on their favorite. The pundits have the Patriots at 5-1. to one. They had the Rams at 10-1, to one, you know, our two Super Bowl teams. But their number two pick was your Pittsburgh Steelers at 8-1. Eight, eight to one. And you think about everything that went wrong this season. And, and, and now you also have James Harrison, another former Steeler, former Super Bowl MVP, or Super Bowl star, uh, came out today. And, you know, you know he's taking great delight in piling on this whole Tomlin thing, but you know they had a lot of great leaders when when Tomlin came to the team, and you know people said that you know he's a players' coach and he, he policed people. Don't forget one of the first things he did when Casey Hampton showed up out of shape for that first training camp, he had him sit out on a field by himself on an exercise bike. Do you remember that day? 
And you do remember him. that. That was that was humiliating yet funny all at the same time. <laughs> it was both. Yeah. And and there's not been that kind of accountability since that first year. I mean, he had some people in the locker room. He had Jerome Bettis, and, and Bettis really, what Bettis' job was, he was sort of the liaison. He was the one who helped keep things in check before it ever had to get to Cowboy. And if there was a problem that, that involved Cowboy, he was the one who represented the players and went in there and talked about it. They also had, you know, strong will people like Joey Porter, they also had Aaron Smith, who didn't say a lot, but who led by example. And they had Heinz Ward. And, and the other thing about this thing, this thing with Heinz Ward today, which which I just found astounding, him saying that, was I never considered Heinz to be the ultimate team player. You know, I mean, I, I thought that he and Ben had their their ups and downs. And yeah. and but you know, the funny thing, remember the year that Heinz held out? The reason he came back is he said that Jerome called him and told him he should come back in, and that was it. That was the end of the controversy. Right there and there, Jerome made the phone call. You're coming back in, Hein. Okay, Jerome, I'll be in tomorrow. But they lack that kind of leadership. I mean, and I mean, if, if Ben is if Ben is your big leader, how is this going to get fixed? Well, I don't know because here's the other part of the sto- that ESPN story that was yeah. really shocking is that they said that the, the players had never seen. Tomlin ever correct Ben. And you mentioned Brady. Apparently, Belichick will just go after Brady sometimes during a meeting because you know why Brady could take it. Right. And also, Brady operates with this chip on his shoulder that, I mean, the whole Jimmy Garoppolo thing, you know, Brady was concerned that he was going to be replaced. Now, here's the greatest quarterback in our time who still has that I could get cut mentality, whereas Ben, Ben, that's never even a, a sign. And then you know Ben has his his radio show, and he yeah. uses that platform to call out his teammates. Not a good thing but, to do. No. Horrible. It's, and that's the one thing that I understand why um, uh, why why AB gets uh, irritable. I I would get irritable to that myself. But, you know, it, it's it's a circus over there. And, and the other part of it is I don't know if you guys have heard any of the, the uh, uh, interviews that that Art Rooney Jr. has done, but he doesn't seem to think that there's a problem of culture on his team. That is a huge problem. Well, he, he well, appears to be out of touch about a lot of things, even during that anthem stuff to me. I, he, I don't get he, it. He's clearly Peter out King of made a, his family members. So Peter King made a great comment about him. Um he said that he sees the way he sees Rooney is that he's just still feeling his um, um, still feeling his oats as an owner. And you know, Dan had had his um, his father around yep. as he was really starting out, and that's that's the one thing that he probably needs right now more than anything is um, you know his father to. Um, kind of help him through and, and, and get through, because you're right. I, I don't know that he does see that there is a is an issue. And that's unbelievable from the outside. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Does, yeah. he, does he have ESPN or ESPN Plus? Does he turn on? I mean, the, the joke, it's funny, but it's not funny at all. And to me, it's disappointing. I've said many times. I mean, here you had a model organization in a lot of ways. Yeah, it took some criticism, maybe rightfully so, about the concussion cover-ups. It probably took some criticism from time to time that they would negotiate with anybody for a while, the Barry Foster thing and some other stuff, although Foster was a jerk-off. Right. But, I mean, they had some negative things around them, but in terms of this kind of nonsense, yeah, you know, like you were saying, Dave, a couple weeks ago or whatever, you know, Blunt was going to sue no and all that kind of – anytime you got a bunch of big egos in a room, I don't care what it is. Hell, even us probably, right? You know, you're going to have some yeah. – difference of opinion but they didn't tolerate this kind of nonsense and now it seems to be constant so if Rooney thinks there's no problem you got to wonder how out of it is this guy now maybe he doesn't want to say more publicly I don't know who knows but no, I mean the other thing too I mean you, you hear the players are all, all talking about you know they, they, they would welcome AB back and you know on the surface 
they have to see it. They are real. They really don't have a choice. Yeah. If they're going to try yeah. to move him, you can't you, you can't devalue him before he goes. Right. I mean, they said the same thing about uh, Le'Veon Le- 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 Bell until he wasn't coming back, and then they raided his locker. So, but uh, I, I mean, I, I understand the game that's going on here. I just, um, you know, what are you going to get for AB if you move him? Maybe a late first round pick. I mean, you're not going to lose. You're going to get yeah, Dave. You are going to take that salary hit. Salary cap yeah, hit, yeah. but keep in mind, you're not taking the hit from Le'Veon Bell, so that's going to free up some of that. So maybe that sting isn't as bad as it, it would have been. Yeah. Well, I, I, again, I, I, I agree with you. I, it's probably not as bad, but you can't keep them. How, how do you keep them at this point? I don't. But, but how? Here's the thing that I just don't understand. He essentially quit on his teammates. Right. That's my issue. Right. And that's and, the most important game of the how, year. And how do you welcome if you're if you're in that locker room? And you're right, Dave. I mean, a lot of them talked about they 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 just they they enjoyed the situation to see what he can get away with. Right. Yeah, that's you bad. Know, and again, that to me, yeah. I'm not going to say that's no respect to Tom. I'm going to say that's no respect to to Rooney. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's I to be honest. I wouldn't re-sign Ben at this point. I blow the damn thing up. I, I, I mean, I, I just, I, I certainly wouldn't be giving him over the top money. I got to tell you that. I mean, no. He doesn't like it too bad. He, he no. sounds like he's going to get about twenty-seven million a year for a guy who looked like shit last year. I thought um, so. Especially four times. Games. I don't, I don't care about his five thousand yards or, I mean, you, you threw some bad balls at some bad times and. You know, again, yeah. you let Ben control the offense. I've got to believe Ben was more at it, uh, taking the running game out of. I mean, you're winning because you have good balance. You lose when you're running the ball ten, fifteen times a game. Right. Pro Bowl running back, like it or lump it, emotions yeah. or not, the guy was a Pro Bowl running back. I mean, that's ridiculous. You're right, Dave. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So I, I just, uh, again. So, so guys, how do you fix this? What do you do? I blow it up myself. I, I, you're not going to change these guys late in their career because if you, if if you can't when have you say AB, blow it up, do you mean the coaching staff as well, or do you mean just the players? I'm going to give Tomlin the break here. I think he does. I think keeping Keith Butler and giving him more responsibility as an outside linebacker coach was kind of a strange move. Um, but I I don't sign Ben again. I, 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 you know, start going for uh, for Rudolph uh, through, and I start rebuilding my defense. I take the money I'm saving from a quarterback who is a year or two away from being a, a hindrance um, on the field, and I start rebuilding my defense. I start, uh, you know, giving this guy, uh, uh, you know, a couple years to mature. And while I'm building my defense, and if you can get a solid defense in the next year or two, well, you know what? You're going to compete for Super Bowls a lot better than you can now. You can't win a Super Bowl with that defense. I don't care what you have on offense. And if you don't have A.B., Juju becomes less of a a threat. And Washington might get there one day, but he's not there now. So, And don't waste a first-round pick on another receiver. Because you you got to fix that defense. you got to make that defense what it was. Um, so that's what I mean by blowing it up. No, I wouldn't get rid of Tomlin at this point. I would, if I'm Rooney, I would certainly redirect him, as Dan Rooney seemed to do with Cower in the in the early 2000s. Um, and to Cower's credit, he, you know, he, he was kind of getting the same criticisms, if you recall, as being too much of a player's coach. Um when they but he had leaders in the locker room. Yeah. So it was. I, I went to look at some of the old articles. It was pretty much verbatim what Tomlin's getting hit around with. And that's, you know, I think Tomlin has enough of a resume that you give him the opportunity. But you gotta, you got to get a little tough with him, too. I mean, obviously, this is not working the way it is. That's what I was going to say. Um, and I don't think it's just it, him. I think at a couple fronts that's got to be the case, I, personally. Yeah. I mean, and you got to put it on Colbert, too. He's the one putting the personalities in the in the room. 
But that's what I mean by blowing it up. And basically, if you're getting rid of A.B., don't re-sign Ben. Let him play out his last year, and then um, you, you move on without him and take take uh, maybe take a, a bad hit or two and start getting some stud defensive players in there. You know, Pittsburgh will support a team that doesn't score 30 points a game as long as it's winning. Yep. So I don't buy this, you know, we got to entertain the fan bullshit. Pittsburgh yep. fans have shown just the opposite. That's I mean, a key hell, they, thing to do there and a key passion there. It's different than other places. It, it's different, you know, it's different than playing in, you know, the middle of the country somewhere, even California. I mean, it's that's a right. passion there. It's intensity. It's Green Bay, bigger. I mean, people right. are going to keep going there. That, that's a bunch of nonsense. That's the modern world with this entertainment stuff. I mean, I had, yeah, can't be completely boring, but if you're winning a lot, people are going to keep filling them seats. So what do you do, Gare? What do you do with it? I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of around where you are, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it a little bit bigger. I mean, I, I, I think Tomlin's had a good enough resume. You know, we're not there, so we don't know how difficult these personalities were. Maybe he did try to rein some, and they just didn't do it. Unfortunately, these guys are under contract. They're making a fortune. You do have to have talent to win. Nice guys don't win, just like we're talking about in baseball all the time. But, you know, if I'm the front office, and I don't know if Rooney's the guy. I mean, I remember some of the ridiculous comments he made during some of that anthem stuff. Like, it's just he's completely clueless. And it sounds like he's clueless from what it was. It was you, Fletch, said that he doesn't, or Dave, he doesn't think there's a problem. I mean, how can you not think there was a problem there? I mean, what are you, 12? I mean, well, I mean the players I, are telling I, you there's a problem. <laughs> I mean, you can see it. Yeah. I mean, you can see it on the sidelines and everything else. You can see it what happened late in the year. You can see it with this nonsense all over, like, you know, some you know, some sitcom or, like, the Kardashians thing is funny. It's a good, you know, Schuster's a pretty bright guy, some of the stuff he says. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, I give Tom another chance, but I'm telling you, you know, stop with the dish rag everywhere. Front of us, uh, we're not doing that again. You're the coach. And your coaching staff, we're not going through this stuff ever again. You know, we, talent's got to be tolerated a little bit differently sometimes. But some of this stuff was just utter nonsense. You know, right. and he can't control the media following Bell working out in some stupid health club somewhere. But I always said during the season, remember, guy, ignore it. You yeah. know, and and I think just ignore that stuff. I'm not talking about that. I mean, I don't love Belichick at all. I can't stand him honestly. But I mean, I kind of respect him and even Reed. And some of those guys, they won't talk about that stuff. Like, get that back. Get that organization back. Start with the coaching yeah. staff. I, I agree with you. I, I think I'm not, I don't know enough about Raymond. I'm not the football guy you guys are. you got to have Ben for maybe the next year. But I certainly wouldn't be bending over backwards to negotiate with him, and, and I wouldn't say much. And if he has a good year, then he, you might have to think differently. If he has a bad year again, you can say, look, this is what you're going to get. Ben, you're going to come back here. If not, too bad. We're going, we're going another direction. So I agree with you. I don't think I'd make it public, though. And honestly, I would have a conversation with him, too. You know, we're tired of your own shit. Yeah, I don't give a shit about his radio show so much. But but, but in that locker room, and when we're doing stuff, and whoever the offensive coordinator says, we're going to try this first, then you're just going to shut up. Sorry. Yeah. You know, you're an employee. Okay? You know, he's he's as bad as Brown and, and Bell were. Worse, perhaps. Right. He's worse than some of these NBA clowns to me. And I can't see bringing a guy back that was that disruptive. I don't care how good he was. I hear the $7 million difference or whatever. Probably not going to get enough now. He helped make it that way. Yeah. I think it's like any other company. You know, we all work for them. We work for organizations. Or I see when we went to Duquesne. Remember how poorly run Duquesne was when we were there? It's run yeah. a lot different now. You can see that if you just go to a basketball or football game. I mean, when your organization is running roughshod and out of control, and I'm going through it now again, you're not accomplishing yeah. much, and all kinds of stuff like this happens. Get the machine back in order, okay? Not everybody has to be an automaton. You can't win with a bunch of slow receivers, you know, and an offensive line that's undersized. But, and I'd pick my leaders. I mean, that, that defensive front, a couple of those guys, and that offensive front, it's hard for those guys to be big-time leaders because they play a, a silent game. But, you know, it used to be in Pittsburgh, and I don't know, Pouncey's been there a long time. He kind of made the first comments about some of this stuff that was out of control, if you remember. Oh, he's, he's, he's also made some out-of-control comments himself. He has, and I think, but again, with anybody who's got the potential there, I would identify them, and I'd say, look, I'm giving he, you this he, ring. He, Pouncey's like one that seems to be taking joy out of this. Yeah, I mean, I don't love some of the things. I, I, I don't I don't know it as well as you guys do. I don't follow football that close, and I'm not in Pittsburgh. But they got it. It seemed like there was a couple guys there that were kind of silent, just do the job. 
You know, yeah. they, they may not have the personality for that, but you've got to have a few guys that have that potential. And I, and I would go to it, and I would tell them, that we're going to expect you to kind of police this in a little bit. Unfortunately, you're always going to have these ridiculous personalities now, particularly in football and basketball, it seems, in baseball a little bit, but particularly those two games. Media helps mm-hmm. foster it. You're not going to be able to rein it in, but you better rein it in enough that you got your machine going. And there's a reason why New England keeps going back to these things. Right. I think they, they do it on, like Fletch said in the past, they do it on the backs of some stuff that kind of runs guys out of there after a while. But this isn't, this isn't kids' football. This isn't for fun. This isn't just entertainment. This is a huge business, huge risks you take, and your, your windows are short. So you let this kind of stuff go on, and that becomes more the circus. It's just too much distraction. And I keep going back to the fact that in combat sports you can't have this. You know, like whether it's, you know, or rather contact sports like football or hockey or stuff like that. It's tough enough to get through all the punishment and the, and the grind and all that kind of stuff that you go through and the physical beating to have this kind of stuff going on too much. It's just too distracting. So yeah. I let, you know, I, I didn't even want to hear about the other guy again. You know, yeah. I would hope that, like, uh, yeah, the, the guy, you know, the, with the bell, I don't want to hear about him again. Uh, you know, as far as Brown's concerned, I would make the best deal I could. Um, I certainly don't want him back at all. I think the quitting part was a big part to me. He seemed to get worse as the season went on. And everything that comes out of the guy's mouth is pertaining to him. You know, and, and I'm not talking about the character of that, but, you know, in football, that is especially ridiculous. You know, it's like yeah. Terrell Owens without even, the, you know, it's, it's like it's, it's Terrell Owens Mentor. is not quite as obnoxious. You know, Mentor. that kind of thing after a while, I don't care how talented you are, it becomes just goodbye. And I don't know, if, I, if, if, I, if, if Rooney has any stones at all where that ownership group does, I would get some of, I would get Tomlin first, I'd get Roethlisberger second, I'd get some of the coaching staff, and I'd say, this is the way we're going to go. I don't care if we go 7-7, seven and seven, we're starting on a road back to non-Circusville. Yeah. That's how I would go. And, and I'm, you know, I'm far from somebody that likes to take orders, and I'm far from somebody that likes an IBM machine. But in some regards, when you get this out of control, I don't think you have much choice. I mean, I don't want my logo or my storied history to be sullied across ESPN and everything else like this year after year after year again. If Tomlin can't do it, then I would say I'd have to move him today. But I would be willing to give him a chance to take back control. And I honestly get some of the animals out of there that were in there before. It may not be as big of a deal. Now, that, they're still not going to win because, as you said, Dave, I don't know, I, I, watching football more this year because we're doing these things that I had in a lot of years, and particularly them, I mean, honest to God, you can't tackle it all in the defensive backfield. The linebackers are way too small. You know, they get a pretty decent pass rush, but it doesn't matter. You know, like, I mean, th- th- that's got to be fixed. That's more important than any of this other personality stuff. But I'd do, it in, I'd do them in conjunction together if it were me. Right. So I would agree. And I don't think they're that far. I mean, I, I think now without Brown, they're going to have some problems. I mean, Schuster's a good guy, but he's certainly not that kind of explosive receiver. And no. you're right. The other kid I mean, is great in college, but he's got to learn a little bit. And, you know, he's, he's got a little ways to go. Um, I, I, I just read the ball around in here a little bit more if I were them, yeah. and I would run the ball a little bit more. I mean, you know, it's funny how teams that can run the ball a little bit are still winning. Yep. And 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 I, I would I would do it that way. I mean, I, I think I think they throw the ball too much. It's like tag football. Yeah. And and I, I think that you know, teams kind of gear up on that after a while. So um, you know, I'm I'm not as worried that they're I don't, they're not they're not they're not horrible. <laughs> yeah. They just fell apart. They didn't have a lot of defense, and I think that locker room just became I don't know. I just think there was more noise going on in it and around it. it became a little toxic. Sure. So, so what, what would you do, Fletch? Well, I mean, I, I think that the defense improved as the year went on. So, I mean, I'm not quite as down on that. It's, yeah, they, they do need some, some help there, but it's not quite as dire. Um, you know, I, another thing, just I, I heard another interview that really stuck to me, too, and it was uh, they interviewed Lusaka Polite, you know, the old pit player. Absolutely. Who um, was signed by New England. Pretty much after they had everything wrapped up, they were going into the Super Bowl to uh, to, to play the Giants. But they they had an injury and they signed Polite. And it's like week 17 or so, so everything's clinched. They they've got nothing to play for. And Tom Brady says to him after his initial practice, 
why don't you stay out here for a little while? I want to do some handoffs with you, and I'm going to throw some passes to you so you can get to feel what the ball like, feels like coming out of my out of my hands. That he took that upon himself to do that. That's the kind of culture that you need. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Where you don't you don't have that here, and yeah. I, I think that that I what you have to do is you have to do a lot with what Gary said. You have to you have to decide who your leaders are at, at all areas of the organization. You get them in, in a room together and you say, look, we're not going to discuss about what happened in the past. We're going to talk about what we're going to be doing in the future, and this is what this is what our how we're going to op- operate. And we're all going to agree on this. And we're all going to leave here on the same page. You know, there's a reason that Marvin Lewis didn't win playoff games. Yep. Yeah. And this is it. Yeah. So right. we'll see what happens. I mean, uh, I think that you, you look at some of the years that, that – the Steelers have a certain – there's a certain um, look about their brand, I guess you would call it. The, the That's what I see. The brand stands for something. Yep. And this year didn't. So nope. It hasn't if, for a while. If you're, right. if you're, if you're the, the leadership, you need, you need to get back to basics on this. You need to take it over and say, okay, fellas, it's time to get on the same page. Right. And if they can't do it, then, Dave, I think you blow it up. You know, one more year? i give it another year. I would. All right. All right. One quick story. Well, uh, they certainly have the talent. I mean, without Brown, it's going to be difficult. It really is going to be difficult. It is. It is. I mean, you're hoping James Washington makes that step. I I actually thought he looked very similar to Brown uh, most of his rookie year. Uh, Brown was not impressive until the end, but – you know, odds are he's not going to turn into what uh, Brown did because, I mean, it's, he's the best who's a receiver who's ever worn a Steeler uniform. I, I think he's a certain Hall of Famer. I think, uh, you know, it's it's a crying shame that his tenure is going to come to an end like this. But got to do it. Got to One do it. One quick story, if we're not pressed for time, give you an example of the leadership thing that you guys have both referred to. Blackhawks yeah. won. Stanley Cup 2010. Blackhawks won a Stanley Cup 2013. Blackhawks got eliminated in the playoffs 2014. Blackhawks got a chance to win the Stanley Cup 2015. Kane's Kane's a great talent, but he's a clearly an egghead. Can't stay away from chicks, drinks too much every time he goes back to Buffalo. Apparently he's a good player, great player. He's gotten more dedicated as grow old, but clearly he's been somewhat of an issue. Now, hockey's a little different, a little more homogenous. Country boys, we know all that, but Goes out, they're playing a big game down the stretch. Can't remember what it was, February. He's not ready to play. It's terrible. It's like a minus three. Gets in the locker room, Taze says to him, listen, you've been doing this for too long. We've been putting up with it. Either knock it off or I'm going to kick your ass. Kane <coughs> challenged him. Taze was bigger. Taze kicked his ass. And he said, listen, I'm the captain. That Blackhawk logo is what we're playing for, not you. You get in line because if you don't, I'll get you out of here. That's what you want in your leadership group. Right. And I'm not espousing physical violence, but my point is, is Taze wore that C for a reason. They won three Stanley Cups because, we you know what? We're not tolerating somebody who's going to make me the case. Right. And the Steelers had every, every one of the Steelers meet guys, they go and defend the other me guy instead of saying, well, they do, no, but bad. we got to fix this. But everything plays out in public, and that's, that's a prime example. Taze did that in the locker room. That's where you guys didn't even know it probably. Right. That's why so, Ben is just not the answer if you want to turn around this ship. Right. Right. But, but regardless, we uh, had some uh, some big events this week. Uh, but Gary, what would your biggest event of the week be? I mean, it's funny. I, I, I was going to try to – you guys are a little more humorous than me. You're smarter than me. I was going to say the Kardashian thing from Schuster, but we took it away. <laughs> but I, I think they both came in the same night, and it goes back. I don't know that much, as you guys know, but what I do know, I think I know a little bit. And it was last night. You know, I mean, Dave, you got a little bit of my venom. I've, I've never liked Tampa Bay, and Fletch, to use your term, John Cooper is a busher. Okay, he's a busher. He is a busher, and 
Last night, what they decide to do is come out and use their size and do every single out-to-the-whistle, over-the-line thing, clip Murray on every puck stop, and they still got their ass kicked. So to me, the event of the week was Pittsburgh basically sending a message, go do what you want. We can push back a little bit, and we can really whip you if you give us too many chances and you take a lot of dumb things or you rile us up. So that and I think the Dukes come back last night after that. VCU game, which was a damn competitive game, a fun game, but lose it. And then last night, to be way down like that and then come back and win against a pretty damn good Rhode Island team. Both of my events of the last week were Pittsburgh-related, and they were last night. Those cool. would be mine. So. Very good. Fletch? Well, Gary, I'm with you on, on that Dukes game last night. That was, that was amazing. But, yep. you know, here we are in Pittsburgh. It's not an NBA town, unfortunately. And I, I – we saw something amazing happen in the NBA over the, over the month of January, and that was James Harden. Yeah. He had a month for the ages. He averaged 43.6 points per game. <laughs> the only person who that that's even close to, that's like Wilt Chamberlain in yeah. 1963. Just amazing. But, you know, and the, the thing that, you know, even though they're different eras, uh, it's funny though, you know. Even though that the, he had that kind of month, his Rockets didn't do all that well. They were oh. you know, what, barely over five hundred. Yeah. And when Will had yeah. his month, the the oh. Warriors were were under five hundred. So, yeah. but still, yeah. I mean, that kind of that kind of streak is just amazing. And uh, I just wanted to call a little attention to that one. No, it was an amazing streak. It was an amazing streak. I, I saw him a couple times just. I mean that that pop back uh, three point shot of his is is just unbelievable and uh, it's been ages since we we've seen a guy who just people can't stop when they drive him. I mean he to me right now he's the best player in the game. I mean he's a creepy dude to me and he's a weird dude but boy you can't I mean how can you do that in today's game? That's just not that just doesn't happen in today's game. Right. No. And he's playing guard too. I mean he's kind of a big he's kind of a big guard off swing man but it's amazing, still. you know. Yeah. Still, I mean, my goodness, I mean. Uh, but you got big daddy. Out, I guess he got the ball more, but that is a staggering number. It's amazing. So. Oh yeah, yeah. No, he is. He is certainly. That's that's a great call, uh, Fletch. He, he he has just had a month for the ages, and and you're right. I mean, he's they're they're not uh, not doing well. I mean, I believe Chris Paul's still up. I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, he's basically doing it one man, one man show. But, um, you know, he's he's uh, he, he's amazing. He is the best player in the game right now. But, um, well, my my big event has to do with our three local basketball teams. Um, I think Pitt's game against Clemson kind of um, showed that maybe they were burning out a little bit, like Duquesne did last year. Um, yep. playing shorthanded. I mean, Pitt really is playing shorthanded this year. Um, and I think uh, we're about to see them pretty much go away as far as any threats. But on the other end, I, I, I'm certain Capel has them going in the right direction like Dan brought last year. Um, but it, 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 when, you, when you're that thin, you don't have size, and you know, you're basically a team playing together for the first time, and you're playing in the ACC. That's that's going to happen. Capel will have this team um, ready to uh, uh, get back to the level they were in a couple of years. I have no doubt about that. Um, Robert Morse is kind of the uh, the people, uh, the team nobody talks about right now. O'Toole, who has just been savaged by transfers over the years. Um, seems like every time he develops uh, good, he's losing two, three players a year to um, Power Five conference teams. Uh, testament to his recruiting, but tough to maintain a team there. Right now, his team has a three-game lead halfway in the NEC. Um, and they're and playing without really a home. A, without a home, which is going to open this week, if I'm not mistaken, or yeah. next week. Yeah, next yeah. week. I think. So, yeah, that's a great point, Fletch. He's, he's playing without a home, and. Um, you know, he, he has them, I mean, hopefully they'll make it through the tournament, but um, 
he has them on another NCAA run this year um, uh, with a lot of things going against them. That's a hell of a coach. Uh, that That is a hell of a coach. And Duquesne last year when they had the heartbreaking, they were 5-2, and two, I believe, when they played Rhode Island up there, uh, Rhode Island uh, top 25 team at the time. Duquesne had a lead the whole game, um, lost towards the end, heartbreaking loss, and then proceeded to lose 10 of their last 12 games. Well, had a similar game against VCU uh, the other night, which uh, without sincere carry, it was going to be tough for them to uh, uh, to emerge victorious. And they really, if they had shot 70% of their foul shooting, which isn't that good, they win that game. So the fear was you play Rhode Island, then they get off to a 19-point deficit in the first half, and you're thinking all over again, oh, my God, is this team about to turn back to what they did last year, become a 500 team. And that second half, gentlemen, that shows what a coach Dan Brott is. That shows Frankie Hughes, who had a, had a very good freshman year in Missouri, a very good shot. That shows finally what he can bring to the table, 20 points in the second half. Um, but Michael Hughes, who is just turning into a beast, making, I don't know if you guys got a chance to see that block he did late in the game with uh, oh, the up by one. Um, uh, Martin, who was just seemingly an incredible kid for um, Rhode Island, going in for a layup to put Rhode Island back ahead. Um, and Hughes comes out of nowhere, just makes a Bill Russell kind of block, a block where you get the ball back, um, not a savage out-of-bounds block, but one where you, you kind of block it uh, and it goes to a teammate, and it wins the game. Um, they were either up by, Duquesne was up by one or two at the time, so it was either going to go into lead or it was going to tie the score. But um, he just makes just an incredible block. And this this is the fifth time this team has come back down double digits. Yep, that's right. That ball game. It's happened a number of times this year. Yep. Uh, the early seven, bunch. seven and four when losing at the half. That's a good coach. It is. And I, I hate to tell you this, Fletch. Oh, boy, here we go. If it doesn't happen this year, it's happening next year. You're dreaming. I think so. I, I you know, Dave, I, I, I'm, I'm coming around. I, I think that uh, join, join us, join us on the bandwagon. Come on, come has, on. Uh, he has me excited about the team again. Well, I mean, look at Kerry. This, this is this is what I always say: the greatest mid-major or lower level football or basketball coaches, they can look at a kid, and they can see something nobody else does. This kid is going yeah. to what is it, Mercyhurst or yeah. Edinburgh? One of the, he's going to a PSAC school and has no Division One offers. Uh, apparently, he had been injured, and that's why he wasn't getting a look. But Dan Brott looks at him at a college uh, showcase and just looks at his assistant coach and asks, "Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? Why is nobody giving this kid a a scholarship?" And he offers him a scholarship, and he's probably one of the most efficient freshmen players we've had in 30, 40 years yeah. on this team. So I, I, I think it's I even mean, more than I, that. The kid that comes in, Don Martin, is really not a true point guard, but he can play it. But, I mean, they don't lose much. I mean, no. you know, they're deep at certain spots. That's the thing that nobody really realizes outside of Pittsburgh. I've seen a lot of that. I mean, they're, they're, they go about eight, nine deep, and they contribute most of the eight or nine. Well, that's they're, they're, the big guy that got injured, their roach off or whatever, that I guess is out for the year. I mean, yeah, but Biz, Bismo comes in, uh, the other the other big freshman. There's a and point he, of three pointers, yep. Yeah, I mean, he, he, there's no drop off. This is what, when we're, we're talking about the Steelers and what makes a team, this is what makes a team. Everybody buying into the system, everybody understanding their role, and everybody giving 110% no matter what the score is. Well, the I felt there was a problem coming with Williams, Dave. Remember when you and me chatted about that yeah. a little bit in December? Yeah. Now we're not seeing yeah. any problems. So somebody went, no. and now these are kids versus men making millions. I get that. Right. Right. But still, somebody said, look, you're a key part of this team. Knock it off, or we're going to move on without you, apparently, is the way it looks to me. He's still a little moody sometimes. That might just be the personality. But, I mean, he's he's back in the fold, and he's playing pretty well, actually. Well. So I, I he was think, never out of it, but he's not pouting now or sitting or being sat down for whole halves. Well, so I, I, somebody's doing the right thing there. I agree. I, agree. I think this game was the game that we're going to look back 
and we're going to say this is when the the program really took the next step because that that was you were looking at a bad history you're looking at what happened last year tough team you're down 19 and you know what you lose that game even if you don't lose by double digits if you lose that game you know what you're you're going to struggle to finish in the upper half of the the teams now all of a sudden you got a confidence you still haven't played many in the bottom half of the league you've had a tough that's what i was going to say you know they've had a tough start to the season. Pitt's had a tough start to the season. Uh, they they got some LaSalle coming up terrible. They got some bad clubs yeah. coming up. So so let's hope that they give the same kind of intensity, and that I'm dragging you, Fletch. I'm dragging you with me. <laughs> I've been we've been you know you you've mocked me for too many years about this. Now I think I think I'm actually right. You may be right. There's a few more people showing up, and I mean just a few, but there are a few more people showing up too, which is also well, they will, they will. They've got to prove it over a longer period of time. Yep. But um, anyways, we got the big game coming this Sunday. Uh, what's what's your call for it, Fletch? Well, I'm I'm going to be contradictory, so just I mean it's going to be a little stream of consciousness thing, but you know okay. the Madden the Madden uh, football has has a ten and five record in the Super Bowl. They okay. do their simulations. They play a hundred games, and they announce who's going to be the winner. And this year, sixty one percent of the times, the the Rams win the game. But here's the thing, guys: the Rams they they can't afford to play like they did the first two playoff games. They got off to very slow starts. I think they're outscored something like twenty to three combined in the first quarter by the Cowboys and the Saints. Then you flip the coin, you see the Patriots came so strong out of the gate. You know, the, the game against the, the Chargers, they had a, like a 14-play, 83-yard touchdown drive that took about half a quarter. Then the next week they did the same thing, 15-play, 80-yard touchdown drive, 8.05 off the clock. So that's, uh, that's a little troubling. You know, the game may be – be decided up front because the Rams are very susceptible to the run and the Patriots who were near the bottom of the league against run, you know, suddenly they look like the steel curtain. You know they they've turned it around in, in the first two games, they've given up something like thirty yards per game on the ground. So I mean that's that's pretty impressive. The other thing that troubles me is the high scoring teams like the Rams, they seem to bog down a lot in the big game. I'm not sure why that is, but I think you guys see where I'm headed. The only hope I have is that the Rams follow that um, that tried and true method of beating the Patriots, and that's where you make Brady feel as uncomfortable as Finoli in a room full of bacon haters. You know, picture that. <laughs> so if Aaron Donald can be extra disruptive, there's a chance. But uh, you know, that being said, guys, Patriots have adjusted to having a limited downfield passing game. They're running the ball really well, and you know they're they're protecting Brady for the most part. Um, I, I think that uh, they're going to use their ball control and red zone finishing. So it's going to be – it's almost going to feel like that year when the, the Giants and, and the Bills played, I think. Uh, I take no joy in this prediction, but here's the thing. I'm going to be eating like a pig, hoping to see some cool commercials, and I'm going to be digging the nugget nectar that I'll be bringing. But I think that the Patriots – You've made my – you've made my uh, – you've made my week are going to uh, earn that sixth rank. I really do. All right. All right. Gary? I mean, I, I think it comes down to the offensive lines, too. I mean, um, and I don't, again, I'm not as deep here, but the Patriot offensive line, Brady got hit a lot this year and sacked a lot, but not in these playoffs. I mean, they've nope. been great. They've been great in these playoffs protecting him. Now, he's moving the ball quick. He's got more options than Goff has to go to in the air, too. But you're right, Fletch, they're running the ball pretty well. But, I mean, on the other hand, though, Donald and Sue and those guys, they can create a lot of havoc. So I think whoever wins that offensive line, and I think the other way as well, I mean, I think when the Rams can run that football and pound it in there, and Gurley's got two weeks to heal, whatever's wrong with him. And obviously something's wrong with him. But you got two weeks to heal. So if, if they can pound it inside and wear the Patriots out a little bit, golf is great when they're running the ball. When they're moving the ball on the ground, you know, he, they run that play action all the time, and then he's hitting everybody. And he doesn't have as many options outside, particularly with the guy that's been gone for the year. I can't remember. Was it Cup, I guess it was. But um, 
I just have a feeling, it, I think you're right, Fletch. I think it's going to be a closer game than a lot of people think. I just hate to say it, too, as much as it troubles me. I, I think it's going to be close, and I think late, I just, it, I don't know if Brady's quite as impressive as Stallback was, you know, when the game's on the line, but he's been there so many times. Uh, he doesn't rattle. If it's a close game, and I think it will be, I kind of think the Patriots win late somehow, field goal, late drive, something like that. But I, I think it's going to be an entertaining one, though. I mean, I could see a 28-26, you know, something like that, 31-28. Like, I could see it be back and forth a little bit. It always comes down to the offensive lines. I think in the first quarter, whoever it, it's a, it's, football's become a game that's got a lot of shifting tides because of the rules, but – it's going to be interesting to see who's winning that battle line of scrimmage early, but I think the Patriots win late in the close game. Hate to say. All right. Well, I'm going to go against you guys. It's not that I don't love you, but Brady's kryptonite is a tough interior rush. There is no better rush than Donald. That is true. And yeah. I not only see the Rams winning, I'm going to say it's going to be 31-21. I think they they control the ball. Um, they have a better running game, but I think that's the difference. I think those two are going to create havoc uh, for Brady. I I, um, I can I, see I, it. There is no better interior rush than what the Rams have, and I think that's going to be the it. difference in this Three game. Days. Yep. Yep. So I will be wearing my L.A. Dodger hat. I own no Rams paraphernalia. But I'm going to be wearing my my L.A. Dodger hat and my Tom Seaver USC baseball jersey. Oh, oh. got the Southern Cal mojo going there. That's right, man. That's right. And, and, and my son Tony is going to be making Korean barbecue, authentic Korean barbecue, okay. in honor of Los Angeles. Okay. So it's going to have a very. There is going to be no fish on this Super Bowl Sunday going to be an all Los Angeles menu. <laughs> there you go. You made a statement. Yes, you did. You did. I think I'm going to pull out the uh, the Super Bowl three. Uh, Joe Willie you Namath. Going, you going Namath jersey? I think I might go Namath jersey. All right. All right. I like it. I like it. You know, it, it is the anniversary. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It be what? Yes, 50. it is. 50. 50. 50. Yeah, well, 50. it is the, the right. 50th the anniversary of the greatest sports year New York has ever gone through, yeah. and the 40th of the greatest one we have ever gone through. Yeah, yeah. and the, you know, to, I think it's the second greatest upset that I can remember. Oh yeah, yeah. I think the number, number one, of course, being the Miracle on Ice. Um, yeah. That yeah, might be number two. Fired me up. Probably. A couple of years ago, I, I, I um, burnt a, a DVD uh, of Super Bowl three, the the Kurt Gowdy telecast. I think I'm going to watch it tomorrow to fire myself up. Oh, I, I tell you what, last Saturday was maybe my favorite. I love the week before Super Bowl because that's when the NFL Films Marathon comes on. And yeah. yeah. There's nothing you know, better than that, fellas. Was it the you Super know, there, Bowl? There is nothing. Stuff too. But it's a Super Bowl I, I'm going to throw this by stuff you. as well. The su- it was Super Bowl highlights. All okay. the Super Bowls, okay. Yeah. yeah. But I want to throw this by you. And my, you know, I, uh, I had my first grandson this week. And, um, you know, I kept thinking. We were talking about Facenda as my daughter-in-law was giving birth. And I thought, what if we put NFL music to labor <laughs> and had John Facenda announcing the labor. Would that be something that would make really people watch? with the women in your house, Dave. I, I'm I just saying. That, I think that child would have hit the wall. He would have come out that hard. There were 26 children that came out of McGee Hospital that night. Oh, and absolutely. Oh. So I'm, I'm getting goosebumps. Other than that, I, I you know, would have no ambition to watch it. Did you discuss that with Viv, Dave, or is that something? I did like not. I, I fear she's in the other room not thinking that, thoughts of me. Um, yeah, um, that's yeah. that's one for our podcast here. But yeah, yeah would man. you have the Monday Night Football entry? Or are you talking about the old? Oh no, no, no! Was, this is well, classic NFL films. Frozen Tundra yeah. music, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. which, well, we, which Gary, if you get I, the I, chance, 
I, rec- I highly recommend purchasing Autumn Thunder. It's a 10 CD uh, collection of all the music from NFL films. Yeah, that would it's be a beautiful be. thing. Yeah, that would it be. is. That would be. It's, it's great to drive to. It's the best driving. Oh, yeah. Well, the, yeah, the problem is, though, that you'll glance down and you'll be doing 95 without really noticing it at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be you'll be cutting in and out, looking looking for that lead block to uh, to get you that extra you car lane. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Why well, used to have a voice like John Facenda, but all those Iron Cities out there took it away from me. So you know, I, <laughs> I know you could be you could have been announcing births at Mercy. Yes, I could have been. <laughs> I picked up some extra cash. Help pay for college. He looks like Count Dracula in diapers. I like it. <laughs> oh, and the slow mo feature on your iPhone. A couple. Of oh. <laughs> That's a, so I, I, I sometimes think, am I back? Am I twenty years old? Am I loaded again when that thing happens? Like, it, it doesn't it give you that weird feeling? Like, what just happened there? Something wrong with my eyes yeah. or my yeah. motor system? Like, it's a weird. It is a weird. You're right. It's a weird thing, gentlemen. But all right. Well, we'll see what happens. We'll be back next week. Enjoy your and Korean we'll, barbecue, uh, uh, Dave and Fletch. What, what's your What's your beer again? I, I mean, I'm getting my nugget beer. nectar. Nugget. There you go. There you go. I'm pumped. I'm I'm pumped. You, all right, uh, gentlemen. You guys enjoy your stuff. All right. all right. You guys have a great night. Same to you. All right. Talk soon. <laughs>